thank you very nice and I'm very happy to be here and uh, get this nice introduction from Cyrus and Sander and I think I will miserably fail, you know, <laughs> and uh, because uh, even though I think um, um, it's, um, it's uh, quite interesting um, to look for higher order effects, but what I'm doing, I have to really to, to minimize it a little bit because this is 50 years old, right? I just read old papers and uh, try to figure out. And this took years. Uh, this uh, took years. Um, but uh, let me give you a little bit of a motivation because I have uh, a bit of time. And uh, so it's uh, um, 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 the SPICE network here. So we have heard everything is spin. And um, um, so the interest of which why we are coming here together is magnetism at the nanoscale, right? So we should start maybe to look at a moment on magnetism on the macro scale. And there you see one image of, uh, you all know, a toy magnet. And as we have heard from Harry Brun, and I agree completely that we should be careful with magnets and magnets, right? And so the classical magnet has a hysteresis, <coughs> like uh, you see there on the bottom. And I just have brought something with me, and people who know me who have seen this, and they start to, to fall asleep. But I have something um, uh, brought with me uh, here, which uh, brings my two last steps in my career uh, from now on um, together. And this is a um, uh, memory device. It's actually a core memory. And uh, this is a core memory out of an IBM 360 system, which is roughly 50 years old. Um, here you see an image uh, from the um, Deutsches Museum in Munich. And the thing is, why is this connecting these two things? Because first, of course, it's IBM. There I met uh, Cyrus and Sander. And second, the IBM 360 system was actually developed uh, close to Stuttgart. So this brings these two together. And uh, this is one of the core memories of such a machine. So now, you know, I looked it up yesterday night, what you can buy nowadays on hard drives. So uh, what I have found, and maybe I'm not as good as uh, other people, is that you can buy a uh, three and a half inch hard drive with 10 terabytes. So now my question, this is 50 years old, how many terabytes are these? <laughs> so does somebody have a guess? Okay, it's not terabytes, as I tell you, but you know, you're scientists, there are other prefactors. Sorry? A kilobyte. It's a kilobyte, you say. It's wrong, it's a kilobit. It's 128 uh, bytes. And I will just pass it through and uh, see, so you see, that is, sorry? Yes, that is, so you are very good. So, no, no, I, I, I'm not, yes. And um, even if you were right, then you have to see that there's an improvement of a factor of 10 million. And then the factor of eight doesn't matter anymore, right? So it's very interesting. And I just have drawn here, here a small um, 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 drawing. Actually, I stole this, I think, from Wikipedia, how this device works. So it's a real memory which works on classical magnetism, actually as the hard drives in our, the magnetic hard drives in our computer still, right? But what is interesting is that this is a, um, you know, that is a, a memory which stores permanently. It's a core memory. But if you read it out, you destroy the information. It's, this sounds a little bit like that we get the trend to quantum mechanics. Because how does it work? So you can magnetize these rings. And you do this by applying currents in this XY grid. So you will see when you pass it through that there's an XY grid of, um, of um, wires through all of these rings. And you can only uh, magnetize or, or change the magnetization when um, current is flowing through X and Y. And that makes it easy. So then you can really address one um, um, core and not all the others. But to read it out, you have to change the magnetization. So let's say the zero is here at this point. So uh, actually here, it's the magnetization in up direction. And now you want to read it out. What you simply do is you um, ramp uh, x and y again, or you just ramp uh, yes, x and y again, and you look what happens at the same signal. If the thing is here, then you would follow this curve. If the thing would be on the down, spin down state, it would be here, and you would get a, a change in magnetization like this curve here, and this would be in the sense line give you a different signal. 
So, but you would destroy the information. Good. So, actually, you think this is 50 years old. Is it still important? Yes, it is still important. That is one of the most reliable memory ever built. And I just looked it up also yesterday evening. Uh, you may never heard, uh, no, you have heard about this, but maybe it's no longer um, in, your, in, your, um, in your mind. But Voyager 1 is the, the most distant machine man has built, right? And uh, it started in 1977. It's still, if you look to the deep space network, you can s still see from Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 daily messages which they receive with about right of 160 bits from a distance. And I put it here, really, this is, I think this will only be for this talk that I ever do this. The distance of this machinery is one and a half light days round trip. So the light, so to give an uh, a command to this machine and to get the feedback that it's, it's arrived, it's one and a half life days, uh, 36 hours. So now you have heard just a few weeks ago there was uh, the, 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 the Pluto mission. Do you know what is this, uh, this round trip time? And we think, oh, so far away. It's only eight hours, right? So this machine is roughly five times further away. And still we receive this. And I find this amazing. This has a machine here. This has a radio transmitter in the range of a few watts. And we receive this. Amazing. And actually, that's why I'm coming to the core memory. Um, the data stored here for the, for, for the images it's sent around is on the tape, right? But for the main computer which makes the navigation, it's a core memory. And even in 1977 there were better or more advanced technologies, but they used it because this is so reliable. Good, but honestly, I'm telling you this and you see I'm fascinated from this, but this is not the reason why I'm interested in magnetism. Uh, okay, now no, I don't know my slide, I see. So now we want to go from the classical to the quantum mechanical world, right? So what is going on there? What is actually driving me there? And uh, first I should, should say there are two people who have uh, driven me quite a bit. And uh, that is here. You cannot read this. Maybe you, hopefully you can read this. So there's written Captain Sander, right? Uh, you see here our chair and um, organizer of this camp conference. And here in the back, you see Dr. Cyrus, um, who um, just gave the last talk, and that is actually me here. And you might ask yourself, what kind of old fancy car is this? <laughs> actually, it's not a car. It's an airplane. And actually, it was Captain Sander who uh, flew us out there at the Bay Area. Um, when was it? This was 2007, right? <laughs> but we landed, and it was very nice, so it was very, very nice. And because Sander um, got his uh, um, 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 pilot license there just a couple of days be um, before. And <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we are experimentalists, we are scientists. So we said, okay, we try this with Sander. And the other thing, and you have seen this too, that's done more the scientific part, was this spectrum. Cyrus has told you a lot about this, but... Um, when uh, I arrived at IBM, that was uh, 2007, two, I think, six, I don't know, seven, six, no, six. Um, <laughs> seven was this published, right. Um, so this spectrum, and Cyrus had this nice model where we, we, we could really understand all where these energies are and how much intensity was there. But I mean, you see, there's much more information in there. And the thing is, this is not, oh, you say, yeah, that is a tip. Damn it. All the spectra look the same. You always get this. You always get this asymmetry that this here is a little bit higher than there, that it's here peaky and here not so peaky. And I wanted to understand this. So you see 2007, now it's 2015, took me um, um, half of my, my life, <laughs> roughly, and uh, my scientific life, let's say. And this is what I want to talk about. And uh, so I present you a, a, few, a few things here, and it's a very simple. So you don't have to read this, it's very simple. We start with a spin half, we go to a spin one, we go then uh, uh, continue with a spin uh, three half, so one and a half, and then we, 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 we finalize uh, the spin uh, two, we have already seen, and then we go something which has, well, maybe a spin or not. And uh, let me start with the spin half, because spin half is the easiest thing. 
And uh, we have heard this from Cyrus already, that um, there in a, in, a, in a spin half, or in a, yeah, that there is something like the Condor effect. And actually, um, it's a couple of years ago, so something like uh, maybe three, four years ago, that we, um, um, I should say that I made this slide, put them together yesterday evening, and so you see I'm not really, um, don't know what I'm talking about. Sorry, so <laughs> let me just give you a brief repetition of what Cyrus told you already. So we have, what is inelastic spin excitation? We have an electron traveling from the tip to a sample and it loses energy somehow, maybe. It changes its state. So it starts here, initial, final state, and here is something like a spin, for example, which changes its, spin, uh, its state from initial to final. So Cyrus has already spoken about this matrix elements here is just very simple um, exchange coupling, so S dot S, and uh, what for my talk will be important, so we just do a little bit more, so here you see again uh, that then you get these uh, this steps here, and we have talking about this matrix element Cyrus has talking about, and I will just do one step more. So I say, okay, I will look for processes where this electron travels, but it does not end here in uh, this state, it's uh, only in, in uh, intermediate state, but it ends then in a final state. So we have initial, uh, middle, final state, and the same for our spin state. So we can write it down in uh, uh, um, um, second order Born approximation, and you see instead of here, these matrix elements squared, you have now just three mat matrices in there. And uh, the important thing is, this is exactly what Kondo already wrote down uh, more than 60 years ago. And there is a de denominator, this intermediate energy minus the initial energy. And you see what happens, this will explode if this reaches, uh, that the intermediate state has the same energy as in, uh, the initial state, right? Actually, here's a delta, like here too, because we have to obey energy conservation. And as Cyrus pointed out, we have to integrate over over the Fermi functions of the electrodes, and the integration over 1 over x is a logarithm. So we will see logarithmic um, peaks. And actually, it started with this molecule. So Cyrus, where's Cyrus now? Sitting, ah, there. There's a molecule, and you are, you are right. <laughs> molecules, molecules, but molecules are so difficult. That's the problem. And you can't pronounce the name. <laughs> so the, the interesting part is that this is a radical molecule which has a nitronyl nitroxide side group that is here. It con consists only of, out of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen atoms, so no metal atoms, but it has a spin. Just it has uh, um, one electron spin, so it's a perfect spin half system, and if you do spectroscopy on it, then you see a peak at zero bias. You can fit it, for example, with a, such a frota function, you can extract a condo temperature, which is for this uh, um, data here, 25 Kelvin, and you would say, okay, 25 Kelvin, then you can, we will discuss later on, it's a critical magnetic field, would be 10 Tesla. Well, let's skip it and go to something else, because this is really hard to do something with this. You would say, if the condo temperature is 25 Kelvin and I'm measuring at 6 Kelvin, then I'm in really in the deep, a uh, strong coupling regime and there should be really, you need really hard energy to change something on the system. Well, um, actually that was not the case. We just cooled further down and what we saw is, so you see here the 6.7 uh, Kelvin data, um, actually it became, the peak became smaller and smaller. Uh, the thing which really um, made me interesting in the whole thing is that if you look at the spectra here, this 1.5 Kelvin, forget about the red line for the second, but you see this is not a Lorentzian or a Frota peak. You think something is strange and you see this very nice, in particular for the low temperature um, 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 data, if you plot it in a, in, a, in a little bit unconventional way, if you, look at, uh, if you plot it with a logarithmic bias, then you see these, uh, these, uh, these uh, shapes here of the, of, the, of the peak become straight lines. This means this is a logarithmic function. 
It's a logarithmic function, and the only thing happens, due to our finite temperature, is that it's broadened by temperature. So we can fit this with a temperature-broadened logarithmic function. Um, and this is interesting because this gives you a fit for temperature over temperature. That's the only fit parameter. This is what happens here, and you see this works quite well. And just to say you, uh, with this model that we have logarithmic peaks here, so second order Born approximation, um, it works also in magnetic field. So we can apply a magnetic field. We only need two Tesla to split this condo peak, simply because two Tesla, because this is, we have to overcome thermal uh, broadening, but not a condo, critical condo field or something like this. And you see this all fits quite well. I will explain you a little bit how this works here. But you see, you can uh, actually fit this surprisingly well with a simple perturbative model, um, which is actually the condom model, the original condom model you find in his paper, which is actually, I can highly recommend read, uh, reading the original paper from Condo. It's a very nice paper. This works because we are in the recoupling limit. Even Condo know this, knew this. So we are here in this area. So what have I drawn here? So I have drawn here temperature, and I have here uh, drawn coupling, and so anti-ferromagnetic coupling, so the coupling with the substrate, and here ferromagnetic coupling. Well, we will talk about this maybe later. And we are at high temperatures, so that perturbation theory is not, it's possible. Condo use perturbation theory. And um, um, uh, us too. Then there is a border, the condo temperature. We will see that this temperature is actually a good estimation for the condo temperature. There are other condo temperatures. And then you have the strong coupling limit, which was the actual condo problem. But I remember when I started with thinking about this, I was speaking to, to a theoretician, of course, no one here in the room. Um, and I asked them, oh, yes, you know, condo problem. I have a problem with the condo problem. And the answer was, the condo problem is solved, period. <laughs> and uh, it's true, absolutely true. So everything is solved. But if you have an experimental view on this, then this does not help you a lot. <laughs> so, um, so what are we actually doing? So now let's look to the second order Born approximation a little bit more in detail. And uh, so there's, there will be a few uh, equations. Don't, don't worry uh, if you don't follow. It doesn't matter. Maybe they are also wrong. Um, <laughs> so we have seen, we want to look for, for the following things. Second order Born approximation. So we want to have this, uh, this, uh, this process uh, drawn here. So we state, so we have states in our spin system. Um, so we start with the uh, state here, we get an interaction, and we end in a state here. So that was what Cyrus explained, uh, spin flip spectroscopy all about, right? With the matrix element, which is uh, given here by uh, direct exchange, plus uh, Tj, which is the tip, in this case, a molecule uh, interaction, right? This is the rate which this happens. Second process we want to look at is that this happens, but uh, that uh, this is only an intermediate state. This says that there is, uh, between this intermediate state to the final state, another interaction. And now we want to assume that this is a weak interaction, so that we are really in the tunneling regime, low currents, only picoamps, maximum nanoamps, and then you can easily think, uh, make yourself clear that the most prominent channel is just this one here, right? Here's a metal underneath, right? It can easily scatter here. So this gives you here then a spin exchange scattering with the substrate here, J. And because you need uh, electrons as a Fermi energy, you have to multiply this with the density of states of that support. Okay, and now you just write down your, um, 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 these two processes. So you see here, there's this one, there's the second one, and then we want just, for the sake of why not, allow also that there's just a Coulomb scattering, right? So here's just U, no spins exchange, it's just a Coulomb scattering. Sorry, Marcus, what, what is Coulomb scattering off of U? Uh, that is just an electron also scattering here through, but it's not S dot S, it's just U. Okay. Just a Coulomb scattering. It's interesting, because this U is uh, not so, it's a, it's a very weird thing. You think usually, ah. Forget it. But it gives you some interference effects which are interesting. So now, because we want to have transport, we have to take the absolute square of this. And here at the end, we have to obey energy conservation, right? That is this delta taking account for 
right, that we have in the, that the final state and the initial state, at the end we get the energy from somewhere. So you can easily do this, and you see here that you get first the inelastic tunneling um, um, part, so just the matrix element and energy, if the energy is uh, high enough, then we get this. Next, we get this condo part here, where we have three matrix elements. That is just this times this. And because it's an absolute square, we have to take the real part or taking it plus the, the uh, complex conjugated. So, sorry, Martin, is there a simple way to understand why E3 is not in the denominator, only E2 and E1? Why E2 and E1? Why only, it's why... The yeah. That comes actually from the, from the Born approximation that you say, so the point is, you get uh, the, the resonance when this process here is um, um, at the same energy. So in principle, I will show you a little drawing later on. This process can be either, look, Im imagine, this is a good drawing. Imagine that you have an electron which has enough energy to uh, make this transition one to three, but not to two. Yeah. Then this becomes a virtual process, right? This is possible because you just, um, um, uh, um, take this energy from the universe and then at the end, it's only at the end where you have to do um, um, energy conservation. Yeah, so it's that energy difference that is defining whether it can happen or not. Exactly, that is the energy difference which makes it the difference between is it a virtual or a real right. process. And at this crossover, you get the, the peak. Yeah. And there it's uh, the, the thing happens. So actually, yes? I, I'm a little confused by that as well. So the real transition the real transition has also an energy denominator here. Well, the, the first term, the inelastic tunneling term, is, is a virtual transition, right? So should it not have an energy denominator? And shouldn't the second one have two? Yes. And uh, you, are, you are true because, I mean, the thing is how, how, how much do you want to simplify the system? Yeah. Because you have to think about in your model, for example, your Anderson model, if you think about that you charge the system, then you have a denominator. But there the energy difference is volts. Mm -hmm. And we are looking here for excitations around millivolts. Yeah. So we can completely skip it. It's always constant. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So you can make it much more complicated. OK. Um, uh, interesting is also the U. So this is a condo-like interaction. The U gives you two terms. First of all, it's U squared. That is just a constant. Second, it gives you, this gives you this term. and. Um, Maybe, I don't know, maybe Sebastian will talk about this a little bit because this allows you, you see here there's the interaction with, with this and this and it must be scattering back to the same uh, state. But this, this state here, this depends on the spin state. So you can somehow read out with this constant, with this U, uh, the spin state without exciting it. And uh, the last term here, I won't talk too much about, but this gives you something asymmetric. Uh, but this is not so important. Okay, let's just look a little bit what kind of these processes are, right? And I want to look at these, these two processes. Not what? Is there an obvious way to see that that is asymmetric? No. Okay. <laughs> so really you have to think, because the thing is, what is the basic idea behind that is, again, that if you have the operator S plus, and then you apply the operator S minus, it is not the same like the opposite, so that they don't commute. That is the thing which makes it. And if you then now, now you have to see what really happens if you make a process in this direction or in that direction, and this makes a difference, and this gives you a sign change. Okay, but all of the other ones are symmetric. All of the other ones are symmetric. But that's, that's really the only term that's going to differ. Be yes, the difference right. And it's interesting, just to, to, to remember this, um, uh, if you look for Fano line shapes, Final line shapes, um, these are mainly seen in condo, but you see this also, for example, people who use uh, tuning fork in AFM might have seen final line shape in their tuning forks. I have seen this because a cable was running wrong and you get an interference. So if you have a resonance and you interfere it with, uh, coherently with a, with, an, uh, with a constant, you get an asymmetric line shape. And uh, it's the same here. Um, you have uh, a resonance, this one, this term, and you have a constant and you interfere them and this gives you an asymmetric line shape. Okay, so just to make sure what, that, we, that we're on the same wavelength, we can just look quickly on this two-spin system, two-spin, two-state system one and two, what is possible, right? 
we can have interactions where, which we label like one one. So where we have an electron coming here is scattered here on the system, so but it's not changing the spin. Right? This can be an up electron or a down electron when we have an up spin system here, or it can make a spin flip. For um, this. Um, this third order pro uh, processes, there are a few more. So you start, but you see that is, you can easily uh, write it down, right? Uh, that you do this. It's just making Feynman diagrams. And these Feynman diagrams, they can also cross so that you have some kind like here, a crossing in there. And we are looking like this, just, just like this. So it's a one crossing approximation, but it's even worse. It's just third order approximation. Nevertheless, what you get out of this is this logarithmic peak. You can look really what happens with this Fermi function and do the math um, and you will see that it comes out something like this. So there's a logarithm. Actually, this is a little bit more complicated, which is good. So this term never goes uh, be, this always goes for energy uh, to plus minus infinity to zero, and not to something like the logarithm is also not a nice function, which is just here broadened by this theta is a step function, so the de theta derivative is again a temperature dependent broadening function and you see this is just a convolution of these two, this logarithmic function and this temperature broadening function and here you see what comes out if you just plot this function. Exactly what we measured in the experiment. I want to make one point um, importance here that the peak height is actually depending, is the logarithmic of the temperature. So if you, you see, this is here just, you increase the temperature by a factor of two and it's always going down um, the same amount, right? Good, okay. So actually, I should say somewhere is written, yes, this model was written down for the spin half system really from Applebaum and Anderson already in the 1966. So really it's 50 years old. Okay. So far, this was a spin half system, a condo system, but we are in the recoupling limit, so we could do all these 50 years old modeling. And uh, in principle, you could also say, well, you should go to somebody who has a lower temperature and do the experiments again. Um, yes. But let me go now to one step more complicated system. That is uh, cobalt hydride or hexagonal boron nitride. Just a brief thing. Um, hexagonal boron nitride is similar like graphene. Let me introduce you the surface. So you see here that is uh, uh, the, the structure. It's like graphene, except that you have no carbon, but you have boron and nitro nitrogen atoms alternating. It's a two-dimensional layer. It has a six electron volt band gap, so it's a nice decoupling layer. And we put it on rhodium. Um, on rhodium, there's a lattice mismatch between these two materials, between the metal and this one, which gives you then produces this, this superstructure. So here is a DFT calculation from uh, Laskowski and Blara. Um, and uh, so this is nice. We, we like this surface. We know how to do this. But this makes it, of course, a very, very um, a, a, a surface which is, has many, many different absorption sites. And we put cobalt on, on top of this, this uh, surface. And um, if we do this, then we see the following. First of all, we see also these kind of like ring states that uh, Harry Brunner in his group has studied. But because we have quite a lot of residual hydrogen, our cobalt atoms are very, very quickly uh, bound to hydrogen, making molecules, actually, right? And we see uh, two different species. We see cobalt hydrogen 2, which uh, shows a condor effect. So here you see condor peak splits with a magnetic field. Here is a simulation, well, this we had just before, we skip this, and then we see here cobalt hydrogen, that it behaves like a spin one system. So you see here two steps, so that is a zero field data, this is increasing magnetic field. You see here two steps of approximately same intensity, and uh, which uh, changes in magnetic field, similar to the iron case um, Cyrus showed. So. And um, it was actually, so you might say, how do we know that this is cobalt hydrogen? Actually, that was uh, due to a uh, wonderful collaboration with uh, Oleg and Valerie from Halle. And Oleg has also a poster, so because they explained with DFT what actually happens there, um, what is the absorption site, and what is our total spin. 
Um, Oleg was very, was very, very, um, from the beginning he said, don't expect me ever to give you an anisotropy. DFT is not good in that. <laughs> but I mean, absorption side and the total spin, he uh, um, was uh, clear that he could give this, and this helped us a lot because we know now that we have such an, uh, such an uh, absorption geometry. The cobalt binds to the nitrogen side, hydrogen sticks up here. This gives you definitely an axis, an, an anisotropy axis, a symmetry axis that is a DZ. Due to this complicated surfaces, the anisotropy is not uh, perfect aligned in this direction, so you have also an in-plane component, so which gives you three steps, and uh, you see that these states here are mixing, so these are quantum states. And um, not a magnet in the sense, in a classical sense. And you see why we have two steps, because you have split one, three eigenstates, and one is a ground state, two excitations. But when we look to our data, and we, did, uh, we, 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 we uh, took quite a lot of data, we saw that all of the data looked different. So in particular, the anisotropy changed quite a lot. And uh, so you see um, uh, that this is very easy visible in the steps. And yeah, then we saw Cyrus' paper and we said, wow, now we have an explanation. And actually, it works uh, actually quite similar, like in his uh, cobalt on uh, copper nitride um, work, that um, it's the coupling to the substrate. And this I will show you now. The interesting thing is that we can hear really, so you see the, the dots are the data, that we don't have a condor effect, right? There's no peak in the center, which is hard to, to, to fit with uh, something analytical which you can easily process uh, um, 50 data sets with, right? But in our system, we don't have a condor effect. We have this third order contribution, but these are really due to, uh, there's no um, 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 state here at zero bias. And we could perfectly fit them, getting out a coupling strength to the substrate. Okay, because it's a little bit tutorial, let me explain how this works. So, if we look, if we write down the state, the, the three states really um, as their eigenvectors, right? Then we see that these, uh, and projected along the main anisotropy axis, the MZ axis, then we see that the ground state, it's <coughs> just a superposition of the plus minus one. And this is an anti-symmetric superposition. The um, state two is a symmetric superposition and the state three is uh, MZ zero. This is very similar to the ion, except that this is with spin two, only three states. If you now look for the transition intensity at zero field, then it's, uh, it's a nice homework to see that this transition from here to here and to here to here must be exactly the same. This is actually exactly the same. The energies are just an example. here. So now, you might have seen that it's funny in the spectra here that the, this, this peak ne peakiness is only at the outer step, not at the inter inner step. How is this possible? And we can look at this. And now we know we have to go over um, some kind like three states. So it's not only a transition from one to two or one to three. Actually, if you look at the matrix elements, there's exactly two which are important, either from one, two, three, or one, three, two. But the probability for these two processes are exactly identical. It's a highly symmetric system. Um, but remember, the intermediate, that was a question, right? The intermediate state energy gives you where the peak is. So one, two, three has a peak at the energy of the, this transition, two but it has to obey energy conservation. So this is only possible after tunneling electron has an energy which is uh, at least as high as the third state, so for example 5.3. So this means what you have here for this blue line is you have a peak here at two, but you literally cut it completely off because you have to have enough energy. For the second, main contributions is one, three, two. You have a peak at three, at energy three, so that's absolutely virtual for most of the time. Uh, 5.3, but uh, energy conservation allows you to have these, uh, these peakness uh, already when you have 
uh, 1.3 um, uh, uh, millivolt bias. So you see here it's cut it off quite only a little bit and you get these strong peaks here. So this is of course just a toy calculation but you see here that you can, even with this this is toy model, you can learn something. You can learn why you have only peaks here. And maybe at the end I can sh show you why all this happens also at the iron. Good. But here this means these peaks are only existing. You see, all, everything is cut off. If you don't have a bias here, then we have no, none of these excitations. So we are really in the weak coupling limit. And uh, this means uh, we can perfectly determine the coupling. And as uh, Cyrus already um, um, showed you, then uh, we can, uh, um, now we have just to ask, why, why does it change uh, the, the energy? And actually, um, <laughs> maybe at risk, yeah, for what? Um, what you actually do there is that you look for, for um, this I also learned from you, Cyrus, I have to say. So I, or from, yeah, from you both. <laughs> so that's another very important book. I mean, you see, everything is old. This is a fantastic book. I can highly recommend this from Cohen uh, Tanudi, um, which allows you really to understand a little bit what's going on. And to make the story um, uh, quick, what these authors do is they look just, okay, how can we describe this system? And the easiest way, or the complete way, is uh, writing down a density matrix. You have seen this, then you have this uh, diagonal element which gives you just the probability to be in a state, right? So the ground state would be everything is here and you excite the system, you get it here. But you have also these coherent uh, coherences where you have a superposition of two states. And uh, you can couple this to a, to a to bath of electrons and uh, ask, for example, what is the lifetime? It's relatively straightforward to calculate this. But if you do this for the coherences, then you see that you get imaginary lifetimes. And imaginary lifetimes are nothing else than energies. So you get an energy renormalization. And uh, yes, you can then just uh, um, uh, look this up, how this works, um, or do it by yourself. It depends, the main important point is it depends on the coupling square. And not to go too much into detail, what as an analogon you can see is take a harmonic oscillator Right? So this is also from Wikipedia. Um, just a harmonic spring and imagine what happens if you damp it. And if you damp a harmonic oscillator, then of course you know the, um, the lifetime goes down. Right? That is what happens right, if you damp it. But what you also get, you get a redshift in energy. A mechanical oscillator uh, which you damp will have lower frequency. That is, so to say, what happens there too except it's, of course, a quantum mechanical system. And uh, we did this, and we looked to our data, and uh, so here you see the spectra, uh, through the two examples. Here you see many examples, where we have plot D, and here's E, the E values, and you see the red one would be uh, um, this these, um, renormalization, which is proportional to uh, J rho naught square, and you see our data, well, okay, it matches somehow. But you see there's also some uh, um, points which do not lie on this because it's much too simple, the, this model. Okay, so you can see this is, uh, um, 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 you can see that, yes, yeah. what can you see, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so next I want to go to, to a system, Cyrus has already said, I, I was very, I, I think it's a fantastic work you have done there. And I'm so happy that you gave me this, this uh, data because I thought, wow, this is so cool. You have data with a condor effect where you have weak coupling, intermediate coupling, strong coupling, maybe. And uh, so I, I, I um, got the data from, uh, from Cyrus um, and I tried to fit it with this perturbation theory. And uh, you see, this is some data um, uh, where they have a relatively weak coupling for different fields, one set of parameters one coupling, only third order perturbation, and you see this works. Well, this works relatively nice. But you see, this is another set, and you see, well, in magnetic field it might work, but here, come on, there's many things wrong. This peak is too small, <laughs> it's only half, this is overshooting here, and then if you, and Cyrus has shown this too, if you look at this one, this is no longer fitting. This is actually fitting, if you do just um, some step function here and a frota function, then it fits. 
but definitely not with a third order perturbation theory because this is in the strong coupling limit. Okay, we should discuss this, I think. And now it's my toy view. And I know it's a dangerous thing I do because um, I'm my toy view, what is condor effect? And it might be completely wrong. People might kill me afterwards. But this is how I do understand this. So let's go back, because then I understand what is strong coupling. Uh, let's go back to have two states, right? Our spin half system. So the blue one is spin up, the right one is spin down. And we think about what happens if we scatter on this, right? Just an electron coming from, from the substrate and scattering on it. It can flip the spin, but if I want to flip this spin to that spin, I have to have here a red electron, so the spin down, which is then taking up the angular momentum, becoming a blue one, right? So this means, if I look for many processes of this, this should, at some point, in this situation, make here more reddish electrons and here more bluish electrons around the system. So it should be like this. If I look how this scattering event happens, I need electrons at the Fermi energy, which are which are occupied, but they find, because this is an, we make it without magnetic field, so same energy, so um, it must also be holes there. This means this is just due to the broadening of the Fermi energy, uh, Fermi function. Uh, this means that this process ha um, um, depends on the scattering rate, of course, but it's only, it's proportional to the temperature, right? It becomes, if you make the uh, temperature lower and lower, this process becomes less and less intense. Well, now I have these, uh, these, uh, these, these uh, correlations around my spins. But the problem is there's the rest of the world, and the rest of the world is damn big, where this can also happen. And this will just destroy my correlation. So no counter effect, no strong coupling effect, nothing. But now I'm looking about that this is a localized spin, so I can have my electron scattering on there and then scattering again, so higher order scattering. And now that's why I wanted to have you have in mind that this logarithmic peak, if you reduce the temperature, it becomes taller and taller. If you now think how many electrons can do this, then you see, okay, this will also be cut off by the reducing of the temperature. But there comes a peak out here, right? And now if you look, what is the ratio between third order and uh, second order, then you get exactly this function. And you know, if third order is the same as second order, then definitely that is the latest point where perturbation theory must break down. Okay, so that is the reason. If I just um, change this to uh, what is the temperature when this happens, then I get my condo temperature. Well, that's exactly what I find in textbook about condo, where I don't understand nothing. <laughs> and now you can ask, why doesn't it happen uh, with uh, this uh, rest of these electrons? And this I don't know, because I mean, I know if you do energy, then you do long chains, and um, there I don't see really what is this. My, my, my feeling is I don't have localized uh, spins here. So if I have a scattering here, to have a third order scattering, I have to have the same system. And uh, they are here we don't have localized spin, spins, so here this was, uh, it's, it's uh, highly reduced to have the third order. But I would be happy if somebody explained me this a little bit better. <coughs> but if I look to this, then I can do more interesting things. Because I can first look, okay, how does this ratio, gamma 3, gamma 2, depend on temperature? And we have seen it here, it's a logarithmic function. So I have a logarithmic function, I can make the point where this is equal, it's a cause of condo temperature. Now I can try to split the system. I just apply a magnetic field. And this is just perturbation theory, but um, it gives me some hint what happens. It happens, for example, that then, okay, you see these curves diverge, and there is a critical temperature which um, where um, um, this never reaches, so this is a little bit about 10 Tesla, this ratio, so the third order will be never as large as the second order. And uh, I was quite stunned. I just played with this, tried to understand what is going on, and maybe there's text uh, <laughs> publication from the 60s where it's already in there. I just don't know them. Because if I look to this data, then it's exactly this formula. So I have a critical magnetic field, and this critical magnetic field at t equals zero, and critical magnetic field at t, this has this formula, and this formula is the same like for superconductors, right? That is, it could also make a critical magnetic field and here uh, the transition temperature of super, the superconductor. For superconductors, this alpha should be two. Here, that is just a fit. I don't know why. It's a three. Um, 
I don't know. But I can also ask, because I said this spin one, and that was the, all, the reason why I wanted to do this. Is my assumption that the spin one system is a non-correlated system that I can do this fitting? And here's the result. So that's the same calculation, just for spin one, where I change now the anisotropy and the temperature. And you see, uh, for anisotropies which are high enough, you never reach the range where perturbation theory, where the higher order terms are overwhelmingly large. So that is maybe the reason why I can fit so well these spin one systems without entering a condo system. Good. Nevertheless, this is all weak coupling, and I should make it absolutely clear, strong coupling is solved, right? So I'm doing really toy models which are just in the weak coupling, which is actually theory of the, the 60s, because uh, there was really a lot of work done, and this was a revolutionary, and that's why I don't understand this, maybe. Um, so why, what is going on here? And if you look to literature, then of course the system is solved. This is a publication already uh, 15 years old, right, where you see here a condo system from the strong coupling regime, T equals zero, to the weak coupling regime, T 10 times uh, condo temperature and magnetic field. Everything exists. Except, what is the nice thing with this perturbative approach is, of course, you can get a hint on your laptop in uh, a fraction of a second. And you can fit real data even uh, um, with, uh, with uh, um, going into this uh, strong coupling regime, which is really hard to calculate if this becomes a more complicated system. Or if there's an iron atom and a cobalt atom coupled and you have uh, many, many states. Okay, um, how long do I have? Some small 10 minutes. What? A little bit less than 10 minutes, maybe. A little, little bit less than 10 minutes. Okay. Um, Good, then I want to show you some data, which is actually very interesting that it's published uh, this year in January, even though it was taken at the same, uh, roughly the same time, 2008 as uh, the data at IBM, but sometimes it uh, takes quite a while until you get uh, things uh, done. And that is, again, this uh, cobalt atom. Cyrus has uh, shown us this already. And we have seen that it splits a magnetic field with different rates, so that is these uh, magnetic field along or the atoms sitting on different absorption sites so that the magnetic effective magnetic field goes in different directions. It splits and now we look with the spin polarized tip. So we will hear certainly a little bit more um, uh, during the conference how to get a spin polarized tip but imagine just you have a spin polarized tip and you look here for these condo peaks and you see well okay they split. So the condo peaks are spin polarized. And um, this is just pure experimentally, so you can just fit it, and it's amazing how well you can fit it. So you can just use the model, um, the second order models, as Cyrus um, um, showed, to fit these outer steps here. We have a strong coupling regime, so you don't have to talk third order. Subtract it from all the data, have left your two steps, so you see here are the steps, and this you can fit perfectly with two uh, frotter functions. Here's the frota function, and the frota function has then only a parameter, the width, the height, and the energy position. Three functions. And uh, so here you see for different magnetic field, and you see something, if you look for this, this one here, B equal three Tesla, and this one B equal five Tesla, that they look almost identical. So it's maybe not such a good idea to plot it along uh, B, but along the splitting of the, the, the magnetic field. If you do this, then you get this kind of plot, which is, of course, horrible. But let me just guide you through this. So first, this is the width. And I'm just showing this here because I hope somebody can explain uh, me this or us this. So this is the width. So you see at zero field, so uh, the splitting is uh, zero, you get the condo temperature out of this, which is about two and a half Kelvin. If you apply a magnetic field, then this increases. But if you uh, apply a magnetic field which compensates the condo temperature, then something happens. So then you again start to be here on a straight line. And this increasing of the width with the splitting of the condo effect is a straight line. And I don't know why it is, but maybe it's just accidentally, but this is a formula for this. This is two times the width for zero field plus one over pi the splitting of the condo. If somebody explains me this, I mean, it's so, so damn close, it's 3% uh, to pi, or 1 over pi, I don't know. 
The other thing is the condo intensity goes down with one over splitting. This gives, if you multiply this, of course, that you have a step here, so the area under the peak has a, has a step function. Because this is one, uh, is linear, this is one over x, this is almost constant. And at the end, the, yes. Ah, no. This is, of course, only for, for the blue line. <coughs> so that is here zero, then something happens. But if I make here a fit, ah, okay. then, and you see, this red point it's is a little bit off. No, 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 it's not. It's only, only for above this field here. Okay, but I wanted to talk actually about the spin polarization. And you see here that the spin polarization of this, or the different height of this peak. We know the spin polarization of the tip. So we can calculate the spin polarization, the effective condo spin polarization, and what comes out, it's 100%. Good. Actually, if you look to literature, then you see that it should be like this, even though it seems that they're systematically a little bit higher for this covert nitrogen. And uh, this is also no problem because it's a very, we don't do any modeling here, we just do fitting. And it might be that the Frota function is not the well function, or it could be that if we would measure with 100% spin polarized tip, that we have on one side a peak and on the other side a dip. Good. Okay, so I think I won't make everything, but I promised about this S equal to iron atom because this was my motivation to start all of this. And uh, so here it is again. Here are the states, five states, as Cyrus showed. And uh, now we just fit this and just tune the things. So that is what Cyrus showed you. That is anisotropy included, second order. And now you just increase a J, the coupling to the substrate. And you see, well, okay, I get my peaks. Next, you increase also the U, and you see you get um, actually almost a perfect fit. That is what you can do. So you can get parameters out of your thing. I have to say, that is also, I mean, uh, um, it's not, so other people have done this too um, 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 in uh, perturbation theory, but it's really nice that you can really have one set par of parameter and uh, getting all this data out. And it helps you to understand your system. That is what I want to say is uh, the, the good thing. Actually, you can do even a little bit more because we have seen, we have looked for, when I showed you my view of what is condo, I have looked for dynamics. I have looked how much scattering rate I have. This I can do, of course, also um, depending on the tunneling current. So, you know, because I have, I, if I write it down, then I have um, um, coupling to the substrate, which wants to, of course, de-excite the system, and my tunneling electron wants to excite the system. And this is actually data that was measured by Sebastian Lode at IBM. Uh, and uh, when I saw this, I went, wow, what is going on here? Why is here a condo peak? Is this a condo peak? What is this? And um, what is actually doing, what, what he did was he did at a B equal 3 Tesla measured once with a uh, non-spin polarized tip and one with a spin polarized tip. And uh, if you just use, if you don't account for rate equations, you will never, can, you cannot um, get an, any spectrum like this out. But if you do this, then you see this is still working quite well. If nothing happened, and this comes out with this. So this is again no parameter free. It's because the tunneling current is set. This I know from Sebastian, and uh, you see this is a reasonable fit. You see this is not a perfect fit, and the reason is that this peak is underestimated, and this makes the whole whole um, 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 simulation a little bit. So here it should be a little bit lower, and here it should be a little bit higher. So there's a peak fitting uh, missing. What actually happens, at least what I believe, is due to the spin polarized tip, you get a current-induced condo effect just between these two states. And the reason is usually they are so far degenerated, this can't be happening. But you have a source, you have your tip, which constantly delivers you one direction of spin current, <coughs> right? Because it's a spin polarized tip. And uh, what happens then is that you have this mz plus one state is correlated with the spin up uh, state in the, in the substrate and the mz plus two state here, the ground state with the spin down, which effectively reduces the magnetization of the system. 
Good. Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, then I show you just briefly. Um, 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 uh, no, I think I skipped this. That makes no sense. Then I would just go. No, no, do it. Okay. You think I should do it? But not if you are too hungry, then. then uh. Okay. For what is this th thing uh, still good? I mean, so I'm, you see, I'm pledging for doing perturbation theory because of what I'm, I can do. We, we can think about what happens if you couple things. And of course, this is then still a toy model. You have always to have in mind that it's a toy model. But let's think about coupling spin half and a spin one, right? And I found it very interesting. So this is my spin half. This is just simulation, right? What happens is that actually, uh, if you couple this antiferromagnetically, you see this peak here at the spin one actually disappears, uh, spin half disappears, and shows up at the spin one. So somehow you transfer, you couple this, you transfer this condo peak to the high spin system. Marcus, yeah? what's going on in the vertical axis there? In the vertical axis. Okay, so no, it's J that's going upward. Right, it's oh. just a coupling. Okay. You see it couples, the state moves a little bit, and you see the, 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 the spectra changes. You just change the coupling because, haha, I do a simulation. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> And of course, I can, um, I mean, that is a thing that is condo, I don't know, but I will show you some data. You can think about um, just, forget about the rest here, but just look at this. This is um, a decoupled system, and you see that for the spin one system, the, uh, now we have an asymmetry, so this is a small step, this is a large step. For the spin half system, here's a small step, and the outer step is a, uh, no, the, <laughs> the inner step is a, the large one and the outer step is a small one. You can understand this if you think that these two are coupled antiferromagnetically. So the ground state is a total spin, roughly spin half. And the excited state is when they are um, um, ferromagnetically coupled with three halves, right? So you get a state level system like this and you can look what are the highest contribution and uh, you see that, for example, for the ground state, that is the spin half is up and the spin one is mz minus, or the other way around. These states which have mz three half, it's clear that both are down or both are up. And here you see it's uh, down and the zero state of the mz, of the, of the S1 system. And now you can think just drawing arrows which is the highest uh, uh, um, uh, probability to, try to, to, try to, to excite the system. For the spin one system, it's of course from here to here. Here I just have to flip the spin, but the, the spin, no, for the spin half system, sorry. For the spin half system, this is a nice transition. You just flip the spin of the spin half, but the spin one stays the same. So that is a low energy transition. Aha, yes, just simulation. For the spin one, it is, this transition, so the high transition, uh, where the spin half stays the same. Okay, is this possible to measure? Yes, it is possible to measure. Here's the data. This is something a little bit more recent that, uh, where we have done the following. We have used our spin one system, you see it here, and we have coupled it just by putting a cobalt atom on our platinum tip, which actually acts like as if it is acting like a spin half system. We can approach it and you see here that uh, um, this inner step becomes um, um, lower in intensity, the outer step becomes higher, and the energy position uh, shifts actually. This we can fit, we can just look where is this, uh, um, this position of the steps, and what we see is that uh, we can really nicely understand this with the coupling of the spin one with the spin half, this is the fit, this is the data points of the uh, po positions. Um, and uh, interestingly, the coupling J, which depends on Z, as we see, is just proportional to the conductance. So it's really the overlap which we change there. One thing I wanted to point out, which I found the most interesting here, this I think, well, yeah, okay, you would, it's not so unexpected, but you see you get an asymmetry here. Right? The outer step here is lower than the outer step here. A bias asymmetry. 
spin polarization. It's zero field. How is this possible? It's not possible. So my toy model is this. Let's start, let's think about that this cobalt atom, platinum is a strange material, and I don't know too much about this, but it's almost on the transition to becoming a ferromagnet. So a magnetic atom on the surface can easily polarize uh, the electrons um, um, close by. So this means if we, for example, have this spin here in the down state, and we look to this transition, then um, we have up electrons, if this is an antiferromagnetic coupling, in the substrate. For this transition, we have to flip this spin from up to zero. So that is an mz minus one. This means for the electron, which does this, it must be an mz plus one. So a transition for the tunneling electron from down to up. And now we see, if we do this in this direction, when a down electron comes from the substrate, goes to an up electron in the sub, uh, during this uh, scattering process, and finds here a lot of states. But for the other direction, it's not possible, because here are a lot of up states, but we need a down state to make this transition. This gives you the asymmetry. So this asymmetry just shows you that this correlation you have in your tip, that you can transfer this correlation in your tip into your system here. OK, but this is, uh, well, it's not yet completely clear. With this, I come to my summary. So you have seen, uh, just I have um, shown you a little bit about what is possible to do with this. And I should definitely mention the people which are involved in this. So this is my um, uh, um, um, little group in, uh, in, uh, in Stuttgart. And uh, that is uh, Peter Jacobsen and uh, Matthias Münks and Gennady Laskin, the three gentlemen here. Um, um, I worked on uh, these uh, projects, and Klaus Kern, um, uh, the Max Buck director, and many people who helped me with everything, and you for your attention. <laughs>